The first image from the James Webb Space Telescope was the deepest and sharpest infrared view of the distant universe to date. Known as Webb's first deep field, this image of galaxy cluster SMAC 0723 is overflowing with detail. Thousands of galaxies, including the faintest objects ever observed in the infrared, appeared in Webb's view for the first time. And the most remarkable thing about this image is that it covers a patch of sky approximately the size of a grain of sand held at an arm's length by someone on the ground. While everyone was in awe of the overflowing details and sharp gravitational lensing in Webb's first deep field, something significant was hiding in plain sight and we nearly missed it. Webb turned out to be so powerful that it could spot individual star clusters and galaxies lying billions of light years away. And one of the most notable cases was of the sparkler galaxy lying near the center of the image. Webb spotted not one, but as many as 12 potential globular clusters around that distant galaxy. But what's so special about these globular clusters? Why are they referred to as some of the most mysterious objects in the universe? Finally, and most importantly, how will this discovery help us better understand the era of the cosmic dawn? Star clusters can contain hundreds, thousands, or even millions of stars. They are divided into two main categories, open and globular. Open clusters are loosely bound groups of a few tens to a few hundreds of stars. They are unstable, and their constituent stars might disperse after a few million years. That's why open clusters are mostly found in irregular and spiral galaxies actively forming stars, but not in elliptical galaxies, whose star formation rate is negligible. On the other hand, globular clusters are much bigger and compact. They can contain millions of stars, tightly bound by gravitational force. These clusters are found in nearly all galaxies. In spiral galaxies such as the Milky Way, globular clusters are located in the galaxy's halo or the outer spheroidal part. We know of about 150 such clusters in our galaxy, and there could be more. Despite being the subject of very active research for decades, we do not know when or understand how these globular clusters form. At present, there are two general views regarding how they were created. One is that globular cluster formation is a phenomenon that occurs at a very high redshift with a deep connection to the initial galaxy assembly. So according to this model, these star clusters were created in the early universe, and their creation channel is different from that driving present-day star formation. The second view associates globular clusters with young stars seen in nearby star bursting and merging galaxies. So, according to this model, the formation of globular clusters is a natural product of continuous galaxy evolution. But since the absolute ages of most of the Milky Way globular clusters are about 12.5 billion years, the first mode that associates them with conditions in the early universe is much more convincing. So, they could be one of the first large-scale objects that started forming in the universe. Thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, we are on the brink of distinguishing observationally between these two cluster formation channels. That's because Webb can scan down to nano-Jansky flux levels at wavelengths beyond 2 microns, and thus observe globular cluster formation at high redshifts. In their paper, the researchers used the data from Webb's first image to analyze the nature of the point sources seen around a galaxy that they fondly named Sparkler. The galaxy lies at a redshift of 1.378, corresponding to a light travel distance of about 9.1 billion light years. Sparkler has been gravitationally lensed by the cluster SMAC 0723 in the foreground. And because of that, it has been strongly magnified by a factor of between 10 to 100. 
Gravitational lensing has not only magnified the sparkler galaxy, but it also has distorted and multiplied its appearance. And in each of the three versions of the sparkler galaxy, the same dots are present. These point sources around the sparkler galaxy have been named sparkles. But how do we know that they were globular clusters instead of small satellite galaxies of sparker? The answer is their stellar mass and surface densities. The sparklers have an average mass between 1 million to 10 million solar masses, which is consistent with a globular cluster lying at such ages of the universe. Besides, the sparkler galaxy itself has a mass of about a billion solar masses, equivalent to the Milky Way's satellite galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Out of these objects marked 1 through 12, number 9 hasn't been included in the analysis because of the high signal-to-noise ratio. In addition, the objects marked 11 and 12 overlap entirely with the bulk of the galaxy, and disentangling their light from that of the host galaxy is extremely difficult. Of the remaining nine objects, the researchers have confirmed that five are definitely globular clusters, while others are extended objects contaminated with light. This is the most important figure in the research paper it plots the star formation history of all the 12 objects around the sparkler galaxy. Pink points and curves show the location and star formation history of individual globular clusters, while orange is used for the remaining extended sources. The x-axis of the curves is the look-back time, and the y-axis is the star formation rate. And one can easily see that there's a typical pattern in the case of the globular clusters. The star formation rate of every confirmed globular cluster peaked in the early universe around the same time. The number 9 object also displays a similar trend, but since its light is contaminated, we cannot confirm it's a globular cluster. You may be wondering, how did astronomers figure out this trend? The answer is the Oxygen-3 spectral line having a wavelength of 500.7 nanometers. This spectral line is a classic signature of ongoing star formation, but its absence at the locations of the globular cluster candidates supports the hypothesis that these are quiescent systems at the epoch of observation. So the researchers studied the Oxygen-3 spectral line maps and found that these globular clusters are in a quiet state. This means they are done with star formation and are mainly composed of old, dying stars. The importance of this discovery lies in the fact that these globular clusters are more than 13 billion years old. They are one of the oldest clusters that we've found to date. Furthermore, their color is consistent with stars originating in the first 500 million years of the Big Bang. That's the same time astronomers believe the first galaxy started forming. If these ages are confirmed, the clusters appear contemporary to the large-scale reionization of the intergalactic medium, hinting at a deep connection between globular cluster formation and the initial phases of galaxy assembly. Gravitational lensing is one of the most important physical phenomena for astronomers studying the distant universe. It magnifies and exposes those objects and regions of the cosmos that would otherwise remain out of sight. For example, even the discovery of Irondale, the most distant star observed in the universe so far, was made possible due to gravitational lensing. It would be interesting to see what more Webb discovers in these peculiar regions of space-time. This concludes the 28th episode of the Sunday Discovery series. So, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it, subscribe to our channel, and press the bell icon so that you don't miss any future episodes of this series.